I am honestly very nervous to make this video, but uh, I do think it is a good kind of nervousness. Hey beautiful people of the internet, my name is Ryan, and disclaimer, this video is going to have some very adult themes. Um, specifically, it's going to talk about depression, suicide, um, topics of that variety. So tread carefully if those topics are ones that uh, are hard for you. That said, those very adult topics are one of the reasons I think that this video is super important to make on this channel. And in fact, it's probably, a video like this has probably been uh, a long time coming on this channel and it maybe should have been made sooner. One of the things that happened um, on this channel when I first started talking about depression and, and anxiety and my relationship to those illnesses um, is that I got a lot of messages um, on the YouTube messages or YouTube inbox um, from a lot of people who in some way or the other had found my videos or had seen me talk about those topics um, and wanted to tell me something or to feel heard or to reach out. That is a thing that I've never really talked about on this channel um, and I'm not really sure how to talk about it. I'm sure I'll talk about it in the future but it's a thing that exists and I wanted people to know that. That's not the point of this video to talk about it but it's uh, been a certain part of this channel since almost the beginning for me um, and I wanted to make that public. What we're going to be doing in this video is actually um, a close reading of a book that is very important to me. Um, Dear Friend, From My Life, I Write to You in Your Life by Eun Lee, who is a professor of mine at Davis um, and on my thesis committee and everything. Amazing, amazing writer, an amazing woman. Um, and this book, of all of her different books, this book is the one that is most amazing to me. So we're going to do a little bit of reading of that. Some background stuff you should know, Eun Lee has mostly only ever written fiction and she's written fiction uh, that... She is a Chinese-American immigrant. Um, she writes fiction that kind of deals with that, but she's also always been very adamant that her fiction is not based on her life. This book, published I think in 2016, um, potentially 2017, 2017, was kind of a like a drastic change um, in the arc of what she had what she had been writing. The idea behind this book and the idea behind the title. Um, that line is taken from a, um, I think a letter of Catherine Mansfield's. Um, and the idea behind this book is it's Ian Lee reading a lot of her favorite writers, specifically their letters, their marginalia, their, um, their journals, um, and kind of having a correspondence with some of her favorite writers and also kind of a correspondence with herself, um, specifically dealing with suicide and depression and mental health. Um, which Ian Lee has more recently been um, kind of public in talking about her struggles with. There is a lot to say about this book, and mostly what I'm gonna do here is just strongly recommend that you read it. This is also a little different for me as a close reading um, because I'm close reading nonfiction, which is, you know, a thing that might work. We'll see, uh, we'll see how it works. What I'm gonna do today is close read from my favorite essay in the entire book, um, the title of which is Memory is a melodrama from which no one is exempt. The general idea behind this uh, this essay, which is a thing you should know really quickly, is that melodrama as a kind of, yeah, that melodrama uh, is kind of misunderstood. Um, that melodrama gets this really kind of crappy reputation um, in art and in life, um, mostly because it is a misunderstood form uh, or a misunderstood relationship with emotion. Um, basically, the people who are being melodramatic, um, a lot of times what's happening there is that they're just so overcome with feeling that they can't play by the same rules that the rest of us play by. Um, and obviously, for Yoon, um, you know, her um, her depression or, or whatever it is, her relationship to her own mental illness is kind of a, is like plays along those same lines. It's kind of an overcome with so much feeling that you can't play, play by the same rules as a lot of other people. And of course that has a lot to say about how we misunderstand ourselves and misunderstand each other and that's kind of one of the brilliant points of this book and the brilliant explorations in it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna read to you two parts. The first one is a little bit longer, the second one is pretty short and I'll kinda do the same thing I did last time which is what I'm gonna do for now, um, which is I'll read and then I'll kinda stop when I need to and say something. This is page 75 uh, in the hard copy version. A writer's letters and journals grant her a triumphant position, however illusory, against time's erosion. They also award a reader the flattering feeling of kinship. 
When Catherine Mansfield claimed in her journal that she loved Chekhov so much she wanted to adopt a Russian baby and name him Anton, her emotional transparency embarrassed me. <sighs> in some ways, one of the reasons I'm starting with this line is that that is in some ways the project of this book. Uh, it's Eun going to try and embarrass herself. Like she's always written fiction, she's always avoided this certain kind of embarrassment. In this book, she's going to embarrass herself. She's going to go to that place, that place of bald admiration. I felt the urge to laugh because I was terrified to recognize even a residue of myself in her. The past tense is important now, apparently that has changed. It occurred to me much later that she was by then dying of tuberculosis, the same disease that led Chekhov to an early death. Our admiration and scrutiny of another person reflect what we love and hate to see in ourselves. Yoon is too good at this, honestly, at setting up what she wants um, from a book and then skewering herself and, and kind of um, like digging into her own motivations for that and just laying them out there and, and, you know, therefore because we feel the same thing, also skewering us. What do we gain from wanting to know a stranger's life? But when we read someone's private words, when we experience her most vulnerable moments with her, and when her words speak more eloquently of our feelings than we are able to, can we still call her a stranger? I have convinced myself that reading letters and journals is a way of having a conversation with those writers. I'm gonna pause right there. That is a feeling I think we all feel. Uh, Ian is obviously setting us up to agree with her there. And then the second part of this sentence falls. But surely it is as glib as calling perusing the music score of a symphony the same as listening to it. A conversation requires more than scribbling in the margins. Which, the irony is palpable here. I'm so guilty of that, and I think we all are, and I think that's kind of Ian's point, is that we think we're having a two-way conversation, when what we're really doing is kind of having a conversation with a different part of ourselves that we don't really want to admit is a part of ourselves. Sometimes I suspect that I am drawn to those who don't converse with me because I have not outgrown a childish, wi childish wish that they will teach me how to live. So a couple things to note about that. Childish, aka because it's too simple. A childish wish that, we will, that they will teach me how to live. Or a slightly more complicated version. I wish that they would teach one how to die. So important in this book uh, is that kind of the flipping of the me versus the one. So Ian has said in the first sentence, teach me how to live. And then when it gets far too personal for the use of that personal pronoun, she says, teach one how to die. It's that kind of evasion that I think we're all doing. We're all avoiding that truth. But their deaths can only be read in edited versions. Their letters and journals come to an end artfully and artificially maneuvered by the editors. The last one collected in Hemingway's letters is to a nine-year-old boy, written three weeks before Hemingway's suicide, and the boy himself only lived another seven years. Turgenev, which I'm probably saying wrong, on his deathbed, wrote to his estranged friend Tolstoy, quote, I am really writing you, therefore, to tell you how happy I have been to, been your, to have been your contemporary, and to express to you my final, sincere request. My friend, return to literature. Mansfield's last note from an unfinished story ends with an observation that only the dying Mansfield would make. Quote, it was an exquisite day. It was one of those days so clear, so still, so silent, you almost feel the earth itself has stopped in astonishment at its own beauty. End quote. The point of that paragraph, I think, is that Ian is kind of setting out for you these list of amazing quotations and specifically amazing because we know the lives that are lived behind these quotations. They're so artful. The problem is, as she mentions earlier, they are also so artificial. They're compiled in the way that they are because, you know, because it, t it makes a better story that way. Um, and even the writers, as they did it themselves, they're compiled that way because that artifice as a part of the art. It makes it the reason that we pay attention, maybe. The last paragraph of this first section that I'm going to read to you. All people lie in their writing as much as in their lives. It frustrates me that I hold on to an unrealistic belief. There is some irrefutable truth in each mind, and the truth is told without concealment or distortion in a letter or in a journal entry. My obligation is to look for that truth. Finding it will offer me the certainty I don't have in me. With that certainty, I will find a way to build a solid self. Notice the way that she's ending this section, which is with almost a statement of the of the incorrect belief. 
Like she starts it off by saying, I hold to an unrealistic belief. And then she states the belief, but she says it so well and eloquently because that is the way Eun is. And so vulnerably, like from a place of real vulnerability and belief that in the reading of those sentences, that, se that final sentence, with that certainty, I will find a way to build a solid self. That reads so certain that I believe it because I've always believed it. I've, I've always thought that that is true problem is that she knows that it is unreal and therefore because she has set up this unrealistic belief and yet still kind of hooked us into it this next section kind of kind of does the work to tear that apart or to make it more complex so i'm skipping forward a couple pages here um a little bit of background what she's quoting here is actually um james allen mcpherson's foreword for a writer of of mcpherson's um who committed suicide so the writer commits suicide um but then a, a collection, I think, of his stories, or his or her stories, um, is going to go out into the world, and so McPherson is asked to write the foreword. This is the quote from that foreword. Phil Oakes hanged himself. Brees Pancake, who was the writer, shot himself. The rest of us, if we are lucky enough to be incapable of imagining such extreme acts of defiance, manage to endure. McPherson wrote towards the end of his foreword. McPherson and Ian were pretty close friends, which is a part that is kind of covered in the other part of this essay. Such kindness one cannot help noticing. I never asked McPherson whether the thought of suicide occurred to him. I never asked him how he managed to endure. That phrasing is definitely a peek inside of Ian's mind, how he managed to endure. But it doesn't matter. I have to live in my own cautionary tale. Some people seek victory in that tale. Others seek escape yet others, peace. I still do not know what I want from mine, but one hopes that to accept not knowing for the time being is better than to accept nothing. I realize I kind of just read straight through that without breaking it up. One of the reasons is that Ian writes so beautifully. Um, but what's going on here is that Ian is kind of playing this chess game of allowing you to peek in to her life and also kind of shoving you away. So one of the things about Eun's career up to this point is that she's written this autobiographical fiction that, or sorry, this not autobiographical fiction that people have continued to ascribe autobiography to. And so when they do that, um, it, the relationship between a reader and her, or a writer and her reader is kind of one of holding them at arm's length. In this book, she doesn't completely get rid of that holding, holding writers, uh, readers at arm's length. She kind of uses it to her, to her advantage. That first section ended with that disbelief, that idea that the wrong belief, that you can kind of in reading someone's words, that you can find something so essential in them, that you can feel essential or solid yourself, that you can kind of deliver yourself from watching someone else's, or reading someone else's cautionary tale. And then she kind of, she points out why that, why that's untrue, why that is, why that's maybe untrue, at least for, for a lot of us, that of course you can find those things um, reading someone else, but also what you're probably doing is just finding a little bit of yourself. You're not actually sitting down and having a conversation with another person. So what that all adds up to, right, is a kind of, it's, it's almost an essay full of the things that you can't do. What you can't believe is X, what you can't believe is Y. And then Eun ends on a very soft note, a very almost, I mean, it's a little bit of a, of an anti-climax, but I mean that in the very best and most real way of the one thing that you can believe, the one thing you can know, is that not knowing is enough. Not knowing is sometimes enough. She says, I never asked him how he managed to endure, but it doesn't matter, I have to live in my own cautionary tale. In other words, McPherson lived a life that Ian Lee wanted to, you know, kind of wanted to, uh, to follow, to try and live that life as well. But what she's learned is that you can't really seek victory or escape or peace in someone else's tale. They're, you're not actually seeing their tale. You're not seeing what it was like to live in the melodrama of their lives. Um, in fact, the only life you can see anything real in is your own. And that's very hard to face. I'm just going to read that last line one more time. Um, and if you would pay attention to the personal and impersonal pronouns. I still, do, I still do not know what I want from mine. But one hopes that to accept not knowing for the time being is better than to accept nothing. It's kind of the opposite ending of, of what we talked about earlier. After leading you through this entire labyrinth of 
what is what it is unreasonable to believe or what it is illogical to believe Ian has brought us to the doorway of belief and instead of giving you all of these solid things to hold on to what she's given you is the small little scrap which is that one of the one of the things it might be worth knowing is that not knowing is is an is a good enough way to endure this book is incredibly unique to me and i think in some ways i may have just butchered it um what i love about that essay and in general what i love about the sections that i just read to you is the kind of very careful um and kind of crafty walking around of like how you talk about your own uh depression or anxiety or your your own relationship relationship to your mental illness in any way that can be useful to another writer um, or to another person and specifically how you read other people's writing or other people's lives and look for you know meaning uh, in your own and I think it's one of the more kind of careful examinations of I'm trying to think how to word it a friend of mine recently actually asked me um, if I enjoyed the book because when friends asked him if he enjoyed the book he usually said not exactly. He loved the book, but he didn't enjoy it. I feel very similarly. Um, I didn't enjoy this book necessarily. It's a very difficult, in the most real way, it's a very difficult read. But what this book does for me is it does kind of steal me. Like it makes me, uh, it makes me feel like I can endure more than I thought that I could. And also that like self-examination does turn out okay in the end. Like it is always worth the effort that you take to examine yourself and what you're, what you're feeling and to examine other people's lives as well um, and examine the way you examine other people's lives, etc. Okay, I think that probably does it. This was a weird venture into close reading nonfiction. Uh, in some ways, because of how unique this book is to me, I am really blind to what it means to other people. If you would like, I would love to know whether or not you want to hear an actual review of this book or want to hear more about it or or what you think there. Um, and then because I think we can never exactly know how our, you know, how our words are going to be received or how someone is going to come across your words, what I do want to do here at the end of the video really quickly is put a couple things down in the, in the comments below. Um, one is a recent Guardian in, uh, interview that Ian gave, which I thought was just kind of lighthearted and fun, um, which I think a lot of you all would enjoy. Um, and then the second thing is I'm going to include some kind of some links and some hotlines um, in case you came to this video suffering in a very a very specific or certain kind of way. Um, and I hope you'll check those out in the description below. Okay, I think that that is actually all that I've got. So I will see you all in a video pretty soon. Until then, best wishes.